Troy University's Hall School of Journalism and Communication presents the 2018 M. Stanton Evans Symposium on Money, Politics, and the Media. The guest speaker for the symposium is Craig Pittman, an award-winning Florida environmental reporter with the Tampa Bay Times. Pittman, a 1981 Troy graduate, is the author of four books, including Oh Florida, How America's Weirdest State Influences the Rest of the Country. As a student journalist, Pittman took pride in having been described by his college dean as the most destructive force on campus. The symposium, held in the Trojan Center ballrooms on the Troy campus, is introduced by Hall School Director Dr. Jefferson T. Spurlock. Welcome to the annual M. Stanton Evans Journalism Symposium on Politics, Money, and the Media. Hi, I'm Jeff Spurlock. I'm the director of the Hall School of Journalism and Communication. And I want to thank you all for such a tremendous turnout for coming out to, to hear Mr. Craig Pittman. Craig is a uh, Troy alum, an investigative journalist, and we're glad to have you back on, on campus, Craig. So thank you so much for joining us again today. I want to, at this time, I want to, want to thank Mr. Steve Stewart and the other faculty of the Hall School of Journalism for orchestrating this event. So let's give him a hand. So. Please, at this moment, if you will, silence your cell phones, turn them off, silence them. We don't want to hear the ringing this morning. Also, at this time, I would like to introduce the Associate Dean of the College of Communication and Fine Arts, my good friend, Dr. Carla Gallahan. Carla? Good morning. I want to begin by thanking you for being here this morning for our annual journalism symposium. I also want to welcome and thank Tom Davis, executive assistant to Chancellor Hawkins, and our guest speaker, Craig Pittman, for being with us today. When visiting the homepage for the Hall School of Journalism, among the many things you will find there is a welcome from the director, Dr. Jeff Spurlock. In this welcome, Dr. Spurlock states that college is about opportunities, about students having the opportunity to make decisions. All of us make decisions each day in a world that is constantly changing. Change is inevitable. Strategic, productive change is not. Reaching consensus on how to change, when to change, and what to do with all of this change can be challenging. Good journalism, at least in part, should help us answer all our questions. This morning is a time to listen, to think critically, to ask questions, and to continue to gather information as a basis for informed decision making. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Steve Stewart, Assistant Professor of Journalism at Troy University. Thank you, Dr. Spurlock and Dr. Gallahan. I want to thank uh, everybody who's helped so much with this event. People have just been stepping forward to offer to help, the faculty, administrators, staff, students, and others. I'm glad to see all of you here in the audience. Uh, I hope you'll be a full participant in this. And when the Q&A time comes, step up to the microphone here and um, make sure that uh, people can hear what you have to say if you ask a question from the floor. And as you'll hear, you can also submit uh, questions through tweets using the hashtag, which is at the bottom of your program, which is hashtag Troy Pittman. Um, I want to invite everybody to one, at 1 o'clock this afternoon, there'll be a, an informal Q&A session with Craig in Wallace Hall, room 336C. That's also noted on your printed program. Uh, this will be a chance to, um, to get um, a little um, more informal and, and uh, hear about Craig's experiences and respond to concerns of students. Uh, this uh, symposium is named for Stan Evans, M. Stanton Evans. I had the pleasure of working with Stan after I came here. And uh, Craig uh, actually knew Stan a lot better than I think I ever did, so I think he may tell us more about Stan. But Stan was an outstanding journalist, and we're honored to have this symposium uh, named after him. You could consider today's symposium to be part two in a history of feisty student journalism at Troy University. Last year, our symposium speaker was Morris Dees. He's best known as founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, but his most direct connection with Troy University was that he successfully sued Troy State College as, as the lawyer for an editor of the TROP who had been censored by the university. 
he won that suit. It was a landmark suit for freedom of expression by student journalists. So that was our speaker last year. And that happened uh, several years before Craig got here. So what you hear about today will have been the aftermath of the, uh, the suit I was talking about. We have two student panelists. I appreciate them being here. Paige Weeks is the news director for Trojan Vision TV. Sable Riley is the editor-in-chief of the Tripolitan. Tom Davis now is going to introduce our speaker. Tom was a student here with Craig. Tom is an accomplished journalist who's been working, I think, for about 20 years with Troy University. Uh, he has been director of university relations in the past. His current position as executive assistant to Chancellor Jack Hawkins. Tom gets the credit for suggesting Craig as our speaker today. So here's Tom Davis to give us greetings from Chancellor Hawkins and to introduce our speaker. No, no. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Stewart. Uh, good morning. On behalf of Chancellor Hawkins, who was out of town today, it is my honor to bring greetings to each of you. But uh, before I do, I would be remiss if I did not welcome, extend a special welcome from the university to a former member of the Hall School faculty who is in the audience today. Ms. Judy Wagnon is here and she was a, pro on a professor at the School of Journalism when Craig and I were students here. Ms. Wagner, we're glad to have you back. Let's welcome her. And I promise I will get that last paper in just, just as soon as I can get around to it. The, uh, if Dr. Hawkins were here today, I believe he would want the students in the audience to hear one central message. In, Carla has already, uh, Dr. Gallahan has already uh, alluded to it. It's a changing world, and technology has changed our world over the past 20 years, like it probably no other time in history. And it certainly uh, changed the practice of journalism. But uh, I believe the central message, the message that the Chancellor want to pass along to you this morning, and I will do so by proxy is that these changes in technology have not altered the need for the things that are taught in the Hall School of Journalism, the values of fairness, accuracy, and Craig, tenacity, uh, and to learn the basic skills of communication, writing, reporting, critical thinking that are vital to achieve excellence in many professions, most notably uh, journalism. And, but to add my personal opinion as a writer, as a, to tack on to that, I can assure you, you will find no better example of journalism excellence than our speaker today. I met Craig Pittman in Wallace Hall, where many of you are familiar with, a place many of you are familiar with, almost 40 years, and in my case, almost 40 pounds ago. We worked together on the staffs of two student newspaper here, student newspapers here, and I should point out that Craig was an excellent reporter and writer and the editorial cartoonist. He did everything but print the paper, I believe. And full disclosure, Craig Pittman is my friend, my personal friend, and I know the dangers inherent of introducing personal friends, the temptation to slip in an inside joke or to take a long stroll down memory lane is always present and uh, almost too much to resist. But I will resist it for your sakes. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> in an era when anyone with a camera and a uh, cell phone camera and a blog can call himself a journalist, Craig Pittman is certainly the real thing. Craig is a native of Pensacola, Florida, who worked for new newspapers in Pensacola and Sarasota before joining the staff of the Tampa Bay Times, Florida's largest and best newspaper. In 1998, Craig began covering environmental issues for the Times, and by any measure, he has made his mark in that field of reporting. He won the Waldo Prophet Award for Distinguished Environmental uh, Journalism in Florida four times, and twice won the Top Investigative Reporting Award from the Society of Environmental Journalists. 
Craig has also won three first place Charlie Awards from the Florida Magazine Association for stories he freelanced for, for Sarasota Magazine. Craig is the author of four books. His most recent is O oh Florida, How America's Weirdest State Influences the Rest of the Country, published in 2016, which won the gold medal for Florida nonfiction from the Florida Book Awards. And uh, I believe it's on sale. Come by and pick up a copy, $17 and change a bargain at twice the price. Craig and his wife, Sherry Robinson, have two sons. One is a freshman at Florida State University and the other one is a high school sophomore, I believe, Craig told me last night. And I know from uh, social media that both uh, these young men share their father's sense of humor and I can tell you that's a very good thing. In summing up my introductory remarks, I want to recap a conversation I had several years ago with the late M. Stanton Evans, for whom this symposium is named and who has already been referenced once or twice this morning. Mr. Evans was an accomplished newspaper editor, author, and syndicated columnist, and he visited the Hall School uh, to teach editorial page and other classes for some 35 years. He saw practically every student that came through the Hall School for well over a generation. Uh, when it became apparent that Mr. Evans would no longer be able to resume his annual teaching duties at Troy, I asked him to name his best student. I was not fishing for a compliment. I knew I was not his best student. Craig and I were in his first class, but I knew I was not his best student. I was naturally curious. I said, who is your best student? He was very evasive, and uh, Ms. Judy Wagon, who you have already met, taught me in beginning reporting that when someone was trying to evade a question, the best thing to do would be to rephrase the question in another way, and maybe you could get your answer that way. So I drew on my Hall School of Journalism training and, and rephrased the question, and I said, Mr. Evans, let me ask it this way. If you were starting a newspaper from scratch and could hire only one Hall School graduate who've come through your classes all these years, who would you hire? He said, oh, that's easy. That'd be Pittman. And uh, it's uh, high praise when uh, praise that is well deserved. And now on behalf of the Chancellor, the Hall School of Journalism and Communication, it is my honor to present our keynote speaker and my friend, Mr. Craig Pittman. Send me the bill. <laughs> well, good morning. Thanks very much for coming today. I really appreciate it. I, I, I have to tell you, I'm really shocked uh, uh, that this invitation to come back to Troy was legitimate. I thought, sure, it was just a ruse to get me to come back here and pay my unpaid parking fines. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I was delighted uh, to hear uh, uh, the man we called M. Stan the Man uh, referenced uh, several times. Uh, M. Stanton Evans was a, a wonderful teacher. Uh, and one of the great things about him is at the end of each semester, he would take some of the money he'd been paid by Troy and throw a big party for us, uh, a big sock hop at, at a deli or some other location. And at one point, he told one of, the, one of my fellow students, he said, Lorraine, he'd had a few at this point. Hey, Lorraine, you know why I fly down here every year and stand up and talk in front of all you students and grade your papers and listen to your complaints and all that? And she said, no, Mr. Evans, why do you do that? He said, for this, for a party like this. Um, I'm delighted Mrs. Wagnon could be here today. Uh, she was a terrific teacher. She constantly was throwing us curveballs, and we had to learn to adapt. Uh, one of the more memorable occasions is when uh, she got into a very loud shouting match with uh, one of the students in class, one of the broadcast students, and the guy cussed her out and stormed out of the class, and then she turned to us and said, okay, I want you to write me a three-take story on what just happened. Turns out it was all a put-up job. Um, and it taught us, you know, very vividly that eyewitness testimony is not necessarily to be trusted. Um, so, uh, one of the things I always put in my, in my bio uh, when, when I'm sending it out to people is that when I worked here at Troy State, worked on the student paper, the dean of the School of Journalism called me the most destructive force on campus. So when they asked me, what are you going to talk about today, I'm gonna, I said, I'm going to tell you how to be the most destructive force on campus. Because I, I figure that's a, that's a pretty useful tool. 
Uh, all right, I think, uh, I think this is set on stun, not kill. Let's see if it works. Yes, um, uh, so yeah, my name is Craig Pittman. I'm a reporter for the Tampa Bay Times, uh, Florida's largest newspaper. I also write a column for the paper called Oh Florida, uh, a monthly column. I've been doing that since 1998. I've almost got the hang of it. Um, uh, I cover environment for the paper, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest job in American journalism, because it means they pay me to go out and ride around on a boat now and again. Um, and I also get to write about some of the really crazy stuff that happens in Florida, uh, like uh, alligators battling pythons in the Everglades, uh, the taxpayers footing the bill for the captive breeding of endangered rats at the Lowry Park Zoo, uh, and somebody had to watch them. So if you ever, had to feel, ever feel like you're having a bad job, just remember the poor guy that had to watch the rats breeding. Um, uh, I've written four books so far, uh, and uh, occasionally pop up on radio and on, on TV. This was during the the hurricane where uh, everybody was saying, oh, Hurricane Irma is going to wipe out Florida. It's going to completely change the way people live there. And I, was, I went on TV to say, no, it's not. If Hurricane Andrew wouldn't do it, nothing's going to change us. Um, and, uh, and like I said, I, they, they pay me to go out and tromp through swamps and ride around on boats and so forth, which is great. Uh, you know, as a journalist, any excuse to get out of the office is a good excuse. And I have a good excuse. I get to go out and, and do all this stuff. So uh, how did I get here? Well, I got here because of Troy. Uh, I got here because I worked on the student newspaper staff and I learned some really important lessons here. Uh, they actually called us at one point, I think it was the Birmingham News or the Montgomery Advertiser, called us foaming at the typewriter journalists. So uh, that was us. Um, uh, I was here from 1978 to 1981 and uh, as Tom said, I, I, I did a lot of different jobs at the newspaper and you said I did everything except print it. Well, I actually did take it to Selma to the printing plant a few times too. <laughs> Um, uh, the big clash that we had over and over and over again is that the university administration contended that the student newspaper should be a public relations arm for the university, that we should print nothing but good news, everything should be, you know, everything should be fine, uh, what's, the, what's the line from the Lego movie, everything is awesome, that should be our theme song every single day, and we kept telling them, no, no, we're a newspaper, we put news in the paper, and it may not be news that you like, but it's news, and people need to know what's going on, and that's what led to the dean of the School of Journalism, of all things, a guy who had been telling us over and over again about all the great things that journalism could do, all the great and courageous stands that reporters had been making, to tell us that by printing news, we were destroying things, which was just a, 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 a tough thing to wrap my mind around. But eventually, it dawned on me he was right. We were destroying things. We were destroying an image, a false image. And we were telling people, this image is not correct. This, this is the reality. This is what you need to know and the, these people are not telling you the truth. And so, yeah, we were being destructive, but in a good way, in the way that journalism has always been and always should be. Um, now, bear in mind that the era in which we were doing this was a, really kind of a golden age for journalism. Um, we, it was a time when uh, Watergate was a very fresh memory. Nixon had resigned in the early 70s in, in the face of being impeached. Uh, and uh, Woodward and Bernstein, uh, uh, had written a book about this that came out in 74, and then the movie version came out in 1976, and it became a huge hit, an Oscar-winning movie. So this is all a fairly fresh thing in the minds of all of us journalism students. Everybody had read the book. Everybody had seen the movie at least once. And so these guys were our heroes, Woodward and Bernstein. Uh, the Pentagon Papers had come out not too long before that. Uh, if you guys have seen that movie, The Post, where it talks about the, the issues involved in printing that, it, once again, sort of being destructive force by showing people all the news that the government has been telling you about Vietnam is a lie, and here's what's really going on here according to the government's own assessment. Uh, and a particular hero of mine at this time was a New York Times reporter named Myron Farber. Uh, he's kind of an obscure character now, but at the time this was pretty fresh. Myron Farber had written a series of stories about a doctor who was purposely killing his patients. And he had gotten some great sources and great documentation of this, and Farber sued him, and, and uh, he had been told, you have to produce your sources, and Farber said, no, I am not going to re reveal my sources. And he actually went to jail for quite a while on contempt of court charges, and rather than reveal his sources. So this is sort of the era of all of this stuff going on, and these are the guys we were hearing about in journalism class being held up to us as heroes, and yet at the same time being told, don't act like them when you work for the student paper. Uh, now the, the TROP, as we could originally, it was the Tropolitan. I don't, what do you guys call it these days? 
The trop, yeah, we, we shortened it to the trop, and because uh, you know, what is tropolitan anyway? What does that even mean? So we shortened it to trop, which we thought was kind of funny because I think in French it means something that's unnecessary. So, <laughs> so we thought that was kind of amusing. But it, since that's what everybody was calling it, we called it that too. Well, it wasn't, wasn't a big paper, but we made some big headlines. For instance, we started doing stories on the drug busts that were going on in the dorms. There were quite a few at that time, uh, including at one point we actually, I don't remember how this started, we got a tip that somebody was being arrested. They were in the process of being arrested. We raced over there. We saw the guy actually being put in the police car. And so our chief photographer, Janet McCoy, who's here today, uh, uh, went with me and we went over to the police station and there was kind of a hill overlooking the area, the, the sally port where they take the guy out. And we got up on the hill and Janet had the camera trained on him and I started yelling at her, shoot him, shoot him. And of course the cops are looking at us like, what are they doing up there? And kind of nervously fingering their guns. But she got the shot, as you can see, and we put it on the front page. And the university was not happy about that. Uh, we also did stories on the State Ethics Commission investigating the, the university president, Ralph W. Adams. Uh, this was really a great era for, to be a student journalist, honestly. There were so many great stories going on. Uh, the uh, Troy's uh, faculty was the lowest paid faculty in the state at the time, and uh, when the faculty complained about that, then the university administration said, well, we have a solution. We'll shut down the religion and philosophy department, because that the guy who was leading the charge was the philosophy professor. We'll shut that department down and then split his salary among everybody else. Well, at the time that was going on, they were also spending thousands and thousands of dollars to redecorate the president's office. So we got the receipts. We got all the receipts from the redecoration and printed them in the paper about how much the carpet cost and how much the new desk was, and oh, they were not happy with that either. Um, and then there was the university yacht. Uh, Troy actually owned a yacht, a 47-foot yacht called the Miss TSU that they anchored down in, I think, Orange Beach. And it had been donated to the university with the idea that it could be used for research. You know, biology majors could go out and take samples in the water and that kind of stuff. It wasn't being used for research. It was being used for, as they called it, public relations purposes, meaning they were taking state legislators out there on fishing trips to wine them and dine them and entertain them. And you know, then they would keep the money flowing to the university, but not necessarily to the faculty or to the students. So we did big stories in that. We did it, including a, an editorial cartoon that I was particularly proud of that showed the, uh, the, the academic dean who was in charge of the yacht, showed him sitting on, on board the yacht wearing a yachting cap and fishing and talking to another administrator and saying, boy, I ho sure hope those st students appreciate all the hard work we do to get them a good education. <laughs> um, so uh, now, not all of our, our uh, time here at Troy was very serious time. Uh, we, uh, uh, at one point, one of the guys who worked uh, for the TSU Press, he was an artist, he was the chief artist, he mouthed off one too many times and they fired him, so he let us know, hey, I'm gonna leave the door to my office unlocked tonight, so see y'all later. And so he left the, the office door unlocked and we got lots and lots of art supplies we could use for the student paper. Um, we uh, uh, would take late night drives to the Boll Weevil Monument in order to just, you know, this is, this is pre-internet. This is what we did before we had cat videos to look at, you know. <laughs> we would drive to the Boll Weevil Monument, which is, I think, still the only monument in America to an insect, which in the world, yes, in the world, that's, that's important. So if you haven't been there, I highly recommend going, just to say you've been. Uh, and um, uh, one of our proudest achievements is we invented a fake student named Thorndike Pike and actually got him in the yearbook. So you could, if you go back and find, I think it was the 81 yearbook, if you go back and look, he's in there. Um, so uh, we were pretty happy with that one. Um, now our, our, uh, our ringleader and sort of ringmaster of all this madness was uh, David McFarlane. He was from Homewood near Birmingham. And uh, David was the uh, editor-in-chief of the paper and uh, was often behind some of the crazy stuff we did, but also he really backed us up and pushed us to do the, do the big stories. Um, well, uh, the administrators decided that the way to squelch the paper would be to fire David. So uh, his grades had dipped, and they said, oh, his grades are not sufficient. He didn't keep his grades up, therefore we're going to remove him as the student editor. Now, at the same time, the head of the yearbook staff, his grades had dipped. Uh, the, uh, the guy who was in charge of the band, his grades had dropped. Uh, the heads of two different uh, fraternities, their grades had dropped, and they were all under the same rules that David was under, but they got to keep their jobs. The university waived the requirements for them. But David, no, they decided he had to go out. Well, we as the student staff said, no, David's our editor. We want him to stay our editor, and we wrote lots of editorials about how they were trying to squelch the student press. So they cut off our funding. 
They said, well, if, if you guys don't want to accept our rules, then we're not going to give you any money. Well, David went to the Student Government Association and uh, negotiated a deal with them in order to continue operation of the paper. They would buy two full-page ads every issue, in, and that was enough to cover what we needed to spend in order to keep the paper going out. We were on a very tenuous footing there. We continued to operate out of the university uh, offices, out of the student newspaper offices, but we figured at any moment they were going to send the uh, campus cops in there to roust us and get us out. So we tried to make contingency plans. Okay, if that happens, where are we going to go? How are we going to continue doing this? That kind of thing. But for some reason, they never did it. I, I, I wonder sometimes if they didn't know where we were, you know? <laughs> um, and so ultimately, and, and this, this uh, grew, this, this controversy grew. All the state's papers jumped on Troy for doing this. They said how, how awful this was. They referenced the uh, court decision that Morsides talked to you guys about last year and said this is just wrong, this is not the way student papers should be treated, student newspapers should have the right to cover the news and to follow the news stories wherever they lead. Um, so in attempting to protect their reputation and, and turn the, the TROP into a PR organ, they had in fact generated bad publicity for the university, which I find, find wonderfully ironic. Um, so ultimately the decision was that uh, the paper was reinstated after about three months but David agreed to voluntarily to step down. He continued on the newspaper staff, but he was not officially the editor, but you know, he sorta of, kinda of was anyway. Um, and we still kept on reporting the news. We kept on breaking those stories after all. And uh, that's the point at which the journalism dean got very frustrated with us, because he was afraid that his job was on the line and that he, he was gonna be the next to get his head chopped off. And so he, that's the point at which he said, you guys are the most destructive force on campus. Well, I can't say he was wrong. Um, so uh, these are some of the lessons that I learned from this, lessons that still stay with me today. One of the big ones is words matter. You know, we were just a kind of a ragtag bunch putting out this newspaper every week, and yet somehow we had shaken the foundations of the university just by putting the truth in the paper. You wouldn't think that would be a big thing, but it was. It really was. They did not want people to know how things really worked at, the, at this university, and we told people, this is how things work. That image is not correct. Here's, in, here's what's really going on, and they didn't like that. Uh, I learned that to government, image is everything, and if you, do, if you write stories that threaten that image, that expose that image, that expose the, the reality behind the facade, that, that expose that you know, this is just a Potemkin village and here's what's really going on, they get very angry. They, they get, uh, but here's the thing is, what you have to do is you have to find the paper trail. Remember I mentioned we had all the receipts from the renovation of the, of the office? Uh, one of us actually went down to Orange Beach and found the yacht and took pictures of it. We had documentation of how much they were spending on it, that kind of thing. You got to have the receipts. You can't just make a statement and say, this is what's going on. You have to be able to back it up. You have to show people, here's where it all came from. Here's the, here's the source. Um, uh, the truth can make powerful people very, very angry, but that's, what, that's our jobs. You know, our job is to report the news without fear or favor. We've got to tell people this is what's going on. You know, this is the whole reason why there is a First Amendment. The whole way our government is set up, it requires informed voters, and informed voters have to know the way the government is spending their money, the way uh, government officials are behaving, what they're doing. The only way people can find that out is if we tell them. And that's why the Founding Fathers put in the Bill of Rights that there should be a free press. We're the ones that tell people what the government's doing with their money and how they're behaving. If we don't do that, then people can't make informed decisions when they vote. Oh, and um, I have to tell you this story. Um, so uh, at one point, I did a story about, uh, it was in the last issue of the paper before summer break, I did a story about drug dealing on campus. And the way we set it up was, uh, a friend of mine arranged for some of the dealers to visit me at a table in the dining hall, and then I wrote, uh, wrote down what they said, but I didn't write down their names, and, you know, we ran a story on it. Well, uh, and there was no, almost no reaction, which surprised me until about halfway through the summer break, I got in the mail a subpoena from the Pike County Grand Jury to come testify. They wanted me to reveal my sources. So, uh, I was, you know, of course, that's a very upsetting thing, particularly my parents. Um, but I talked to a, a lawyer I knew in Pensacola, and he said, he said, listen, Alabama has a really strong shield law for journalists, and you should not have to name your sources if, you, if that's part of your, your reporting. And I said, okay. So I drove back up here in the middle of the summer and went before the Pike County Grand Jury, and David McFarland, the rabble-raising uh, editor, drove over from Montgomery to sit outside the Grand Jury room door just in case they threw me in jail, because that, that, that was a chance. 
Well, I went in and told the grand jury I wasn't going to tell them who the names were, and they kicked me out. And, uh, and David said, oh, they didn't, they didn't put you in jail? I said, no. And I said, David, I'm just curious. If they had put me in jail, what would you have done? David said, well, I would have had a hell of a story for one thing. <laughs> So if the grand jury calls you, take a friend, somebody to get the news out. Uh, now, um, uh, I want to give you guys some practical information, too. Um, uh, at the Times, I, when I went to the, what was then the St. Petersburg Times, it, it was best known for, uh, as some people call it, writing with a capital W, you know, these very, the, what they call now long-form stories that tell people a lot about how people live and what they do and that kind of thing. But there was also this uh, long tradition of hard-hitting investigations, one of which I worked on involved uh, uh, the Reverend Henry Lyons, who was the head of the National Baptist Convention, and uh, wound up being charged with fraud because he was uh, uh, inflating the number of members and selling that information to corporations without the knowledge of the, of the, uh, the denomination. Uh, a, a story, by the way, which got started because his wife uh, happened to notice some gifts in the trunk of their car before Christmas that she thought she was going to get, and then she didn't get them which tipped her off that Reverend Lyons was seeing another woman. And then she tracked down where their love nest was. It was this beautiful waterfront mansion in Tierra Verde. So she went out there and set fire to it. <laughs> and so our cop beat reporter got the tip on this and called her up and said, Mrs. Lyons, why did you set fire to the, to the mansion? And she said, oh, it was an accident. I was smoking and I dropped my cigarette. And he said, really, what brand do you smoke? Long silence, <laughs> long silence. She, every smoker knows their brand. So uh, that sort of led to us opening this whole can of worms. We did this big investigation. And actually, we were ahead of the sheriff's office in investigating what was going on there. We were getting, it was the first time I, I realized the, the big reach of a, a journalistic investigation could have because we were getting story tips from people from all around the country who were members of the denomination and had seen things or heard things or actually had documents that they could pass on to us about all the stuff that Reverend Lyons was doing to rip off the denomination. Um, uh, and I mentioned the beat reporter, because to me, beat reporting is the way we save journalism. You have one person covering a beat all the time, and often they end up knowing more than the people they're covering about the way things work, and they're able to explain it in a way that the readers can understand. That's the essential role of journalism, as far as I'm concerned. I've never been anything but a beat reporter. I've covered politics, I've covered local government, covered courts, which was very entertaining. At one point, I covered a guy who'd been charged with bigamy, and his, his defense to the bigamy charge was to say, I forgot I was married. <laughs> and it worked. He was acquitted. Um, uh, so uh, it's just it's so essential to, to showing people how their money's being spent. If you've got beat reporters who can cover that beat in a way that enables them to explain to people what's going on. Um, so, uh, in covering the environmental beat, one of the things that, that I have learned, one of the things that I want to pass on to you, is to look for your unified field theory. Look for, you have different events that you cover. What is it that connects them? What is it that is the thread that runs through all of them? Well, for me, it, and, and look for the story that nobody else is writing. Don't just follow the pack. Try and be your own person and, and look for something that nobody else has, has gotten onto yet. For me, uh, I was covering a lot of controversial developments all around the state, and all of them, all of them needed wetlands permits. They needed permits from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to fill in wetlands, because Florida has more wetlands than any other state except Alaska. So uh, I started poking around in that with the help of another reporter. Uh, we, we realized, when we realized that the Corps was issuing more of these permits in Florida than any other state, we said, this is a story, we, got to, we really have to get on this. So we started really looking at where the Corps was issuing permits. We found out that the permits all had GIS coordinates in them, and we thought, well, this is great. We'll get their database, and then we'll be able to plot out where all the permits are and show people where the wetlands are going away. Well, the, the Corps fought us for a year and finally turned over the database, and when we saw it, we realized why they'd fought us, which was it had left out lots of information. Uh, some of the GIS points were in Pennsylvania or out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. It was just, it was a disaster. So. Uh, this is where the point where I tell you, usually if what you're working on was easy, somebody else would have done it by now. If it's hard, that's why you're the first one doing it, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Uh, so uh, this was sort of the first time I really took, took on a really big project. And, and so here's some lessons on how to get organized to do one of those. Start by building a timeline. Figure out when things happen and then add to it as you get more. Sometimes that will show you that things are happening at the same time that you didn't even realize about that they, there's a connection. Um, build a list of sources that you put them in a, a searchable way that you can find them pretty easily. 
uh, type up detailed inter interview notes as quickly as you can and put them in a searchable format. We used a, a wiki, an internal wiki. You can also use uh, Google Drive in a way so you could share it between reporters. Uh, know how to create and use spreadsheets. We built our own spreadsheets and that showed us a lot of information that even the Corps of Engineers didn't have. Um, and uh, ask about numbers. Ask the people you're covering, what are you counting and what are you not counting? Because sometimes that's pretty significant. And then find out who's compiling those numbers. Um, when we talked to the Corps of Engineers, uh, they said, believe it or not, they said, we're issuing so many permits, we're not tracking how many we're issuing or who we're giving them to. So uh, we said, well, um, who, do, do, is, do you track anything? And they said, well, yeah, we have to file a quarterly report with the Pentagon, it, paper reports, all these paper reports. And we said, where do you keep the paper reports? Well, they're all in Nancy's desk. This poor woman named Nancy, she, her desk was crammed with these paper reports they'd been sending to the Pentagon. So we filed a Freedom of Information Act request for Nancy's desk and uh, got all those paper reports, built our own spreadsheet, and figured out that the core, uh, in, in the time period we were looking at, had issued 12,000 permits in Florida to destroy wetlands. Can you guess how many they said no to? One. One. They had rejected one permit in all that time. 12,000 yeses and one no. And that guy was so mad. <laughs> he could not understand why they, why they wouldn't give him his permit. Um, uh, and we took that information back and showed it to the core, and they said, wow, we wish we could do that. Uh, and so then we started trying to figure out, okay, how can we document how many wetlands have been lost? And what we ended up doing was using satellite imagery, which no other paper had ever done before. We got satellite imagery for 1990, and we got satellite imagery for the year we were doing this, which was 2004, and then we analyzed where the wetlands had been and then where they had been paved over. And we came up with a number of, I think it was 84,000 acres that the Corps had allowed to be destroyed during that time. So, and again, we took and showed it to the Corps of Engineers and they said, wow, we wish we could do that. And we're like, you can, it's not that hard. But again, you know, we weren't just ripping apart a facade that had been built up. We were actually doing the government's job for it and answering questions nobody had even asked before. And uh, to me, that's the essence of what good journalists do, is you find out how things really work, and then you tell people about it. So uh, that series led to uh, the book Paving Paradise, uh, uh, Florida's Vanishing Wetlands and the Failure of No Net Loss, which uh, another reporter and I wrote together. And then uh, I followed that up with a solo, my first solo book, Manatee and Sanity, uh, which I got the name off of a t-shirt, so if you're ever writing a book and you're stuck for a title, look at the t-shirts around you, you might get a good idea. Um, and then I, I wrote a book called The Scent of Scandal, uh, which is about orchid smugglers. A guy smuggled an orchid into Florida, took it to Selby Botanical Gardens in Sarasota to get it named after him. Peru, where he had found the orchid, uh, filed a formal complaint. It became an international incident. Armed federal officers raided his greenhouse, seized his orchids, and also his spec script for a new reality show called The Orchid Hunter. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was what made him most upset. Grand jury got involved. It was, it was a huge mess. Uh, anyway, this book is not like any other book that's ever been published because as far as I can tell, it's the only one ever classified as true crime slash gardening. I always feel bad for the bookstore clerk trying to figure out where it goes. Uh, and then the, the new one, uh, O Flora, How America's Weirdest State Influences the Rest of the Country, which is full of stories uh, like, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the guy who uh, claimed he was a, a count in Key West, but was not a count, he's more of a no account. Uh, and he was working as an x-ray technician and he fell in love with one of his patients, the beautiful Maria, and his love for her transcended death by which I mean after she died, he dug up the body and lived with it for nine years um, until his, her sister found out and, of course, was horrified, reported into the authorities, and uh, he was put on trial for desecrating a grave, but ultimately acquitted because the statute of limitations had run out. So <laughs> that's a classic Florida story. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm now working on a book about Florida Panther. The tentative title is Cat Fight, and I'm hoping it'll come out in 2019, so keep an eye out for that one. And... Do I have time for questions? Can I ask questions? Or can people ask questions? Or can you ask questions? I don't know. I don't, well, however you guys want to work it. I'm going to take a Marco Rubio break and get a sip of water. <laughs> So I know you guys have questions. If you um, want to tweet them, you can tweet your questions and I'll try to keep track on Twitter. Um, if you decide to come forward and ask questions, please step all the way forward to the microphone and speak directly into the microphone um, so that 
uh, Trojan vision can capture you. Um, but I think that uh, Paige and Sable may have something ready to go. Any questions? Paige, why don't you go first? Can I also mention my Twitter handle is, is uh, Craig Times. So if you guys want to tweet at me, I'll try and get to your, your questions later. Oh, also, that's my email address right there. Okay, well, you wanted me to ask a hard question. Yes. I don't know if this is what that's going to be, so I hate to disappoint you. I'll tell you all you the dirt on Tom Davis, whatever you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my question. You faced a leader who was over you, who was supposed to tell you this is how you do things, you know, fight for the truth. Today, we as journalists going into the field, we don't only face a president and other leaders who claim fake news with everything that's put out there. We also face an audience who mm -hmm. don't want to know the truth if it goes against their own opinion. How do you find the motivation to continue putting the truth out there for people who don't even want to give you the time of day? Well, you have to remember you're not doing this uh, for glory. You're not doing this for acclamation or approbation or any of those Asians. Uh, you're doing it because your calling, if you will, is to report the truth and let the chips fall where they may. Um, um, one of the stories I did at the Times, uh, I did a story on how Florida had built a whole bunch of toll roads and they had basically opened up parts of Florida to urban sprawl and they had been built under false pretenses that they were supposed to fast, pass a certain financial test and that they actually they had all flunked, but then the Department of Transportation had phonied up the numbers to make them look good. And now the taxpayers and so forth were kind of on the hook for running these roads that weren't paying their own way. And I thought, when I wrote the story, I thought, well, you know, this will really get people's attention. This will get some action. Well, it did. The legislature came in and loosened up the financial rules so that what they were doing was okay. So that taught me a good lesson, which is our job is not to change things. Our job is to tell people what's really going on. What they do about it is up to them. The editorial page can certainly get in there and advocate for one side or another, but your job as a reporter is to just tell people what's really going on. And once you've done that, regardless of the reaction, then you've done your job. So focus on doing your job. And if people yell at you about it, well, that means you've done it pretty well, probably. Um, how did you find the receipts and the paper trail for the furnishings in the Chancellor's house and for the yacht? Uh, I seem to recall it was all public record, just a matter of tracking down which office in the university had it. Uh, I don't think we dealt with any secret sources or anything like that. I think it was just judicious use of the public records law. And, um, um, you know, it's funny the stuff that's out there that people don't even think to ask about. When we were doing the wetlands series, we went and talked to a bunch of Corps of Engineers guys who willingly talked to us on the record and said what a sham the program was. And they, they, one of them said, I've just been waiting for someone to come talk to me. So you're probably going to find that if you start asking people. I mean, <clears throat> stories are everywhere. Stories are all over the place. You, you, you just about trip over them sometimes. Uh, one of my newspaper's biggest investigations started with one of the reporters chatting with the bag boy at her grocery store. And he told her about his, he, she got him talking and he kind of told her his life story and told her about this horrific abuse he had suffered in a juvenile facility up in the Florida Panhandle. And that led to us doing this big story about that particular facility. If she hadn't chatted up her bag boy, we would never have stumbled across that story. That's when I say stories are everywhere. And if you know how to use the tools that you've been given, the public records law, uh, you know, I mentioned about, I always tell journalism students, know how to use spreadsheets. They've saved my butt more times than I can count. Learn how to use those tools and you'd be amazed at the stuff you come up with. Coming from Emily Thompson on Twitter, Craig, was there ever a story that you were conflicted about publishing? Ooh, that is a hard question. Um, um, a lot of times on, when I was covering courts, there were stories that I felt very conflicted about because uh, when you're covering, I was covering criminal courts and a lot of the stuff I was covering, people's agony was right there on display for anybody to see, but I was the one seeing it. And this, these were cases that may not have made the TV, may have just been, I'm, I was, a lot of times I was the only reporter in the courtroom for this stuff. And uh, one of the things that I learned from that is that whenever someone commits a crime, there is more than one victim. There is the victim of the crime, but then there's also the family members of that victim. And there's also the family members of the accused. They didn't do anything wrong, but they're being dragged through this agony as well. And so 
uh, a lot of times all of that, all of those emotions were being on, were put on display. And so I sometimes felt very, um, I had to deal with protective feelings towards these people. You know, you see people going through agony and you think, if I write a story about this, is this going to make it worse? But that's not my job. My job is to tell people what's going on, to, to inform, to make the reader feel like he or she is in the courtroom while it's going on. And so that's what I tried to do. And it was kind of ironic. Some people yelled at me about it. Uh, but others said, thank you. Thank you for letting people know what the, what this does to a family member if you commit a crime, what, you know, what this does to the mother and the father and sister and so forth. So um, uh, that made me feel better about doing those kind of stories uh, going forward from there. But it's, it's tough. And uh, if you're out at a crime scene, for instance, uh, a lot of times you'll be dealing with people who They've just hit the, heard the biggest shock of their lives, and they're grappling with it right there in public view, right in front of you. Do you, you know, pull out your cell phone and do a Facebook Live of what they're going through right then, or do you maybe back off and give them a chance to deal with it and process it before you talk to them? Those are questions you're going to have to answer for yourselves. Um, uh, one interesting thing that I learned is that you can be too aggressive. Uh, we had a, uh, a case where a policeman was shot and bled to death before his colleagues could get to him because their radio system was bad. So they, didn't, they weren't able to find him in time. And so uh, they arrested the uh, uh, burglar who had shot him, had pulled it, managed to get his gun away from the guy and shot him with his own gun. And so um, the widow, the policeman's widow, of course, came to the trial, came every day to the trial, TV cameras in her face every single day you know, while she's dealing with this. And um, I just passed her a note that said, if you want to talk, I'm here. If you don't, I, I respect that and I won't bother you. And so she didn't talk to any of the TV people at all during the trial. But once it was over, about a week after it was over, she sent me a note and said, I'm going to talk to you and you're the only person I'm talking to because you gave me space. And so I got a, I got a great story out of her about what she had been through and how this had changed her life in such a way that she had decided to abandon her nursing career and instead become a forensic technician for the police department. So you have to make that judgment call on each thing that you're covering and decide what it is you have to do and what's the best way to get the story and still maintain your humanity as well. Nathaniel Rodriguez tweeted, do you think there's a lack of courageous journalism in today's world? Um, well, hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I see a lot of really good journalism going on, uh, and, and it's bearing fruit. Um, the New York Times and Washington Post have seen huge increases in their readership because they're breaking stories just about every day about things that are going on. And uh, um, for instance, uh, a guy who used to work, I used to work with at the Times has been doing a series of stories about all the money that the EPA administrator has been blowing taking first class flights to places when he could be taking government planes. And his justification for taking first class is that if he sits in coach, people yell at him about screwing up the environment. So, <laughs> so I mean, those are, those are great stories. And once again, he's got the receipts, you know? He's got the paperwork showing, yeah, this is what's really going on. Um, uh, I think sometimes there is an inclination to be, particularly in, I don't want to seem overly con uh, critical of broadcast, but that, to me is where it's easier to back off and let people say what they want to say and then not challenge them when they say things that are clearly not true. And I think in those instances, the better reporters are the ones who will say, wait a minute, you didn't say that last week. Last week you were saying this. It's sort of a, the whole, I think it was Luke Russert that sort of pioneered this, where people would come on his show and they'd, some politician would make some statement. He'd say, wait a minute, we have video of you saying the complete opposite two weeks ago, and here it is. And they'd have it ready and ready to roll. And then they'd leave the politician stammering, trying to explain himself. To me, that is not just great TV. It's also great journalism to say, listen, you, you need to, you, you've said two different things here. Which one's the correct answer? And, and I think it's too easy these days for people to just go on TV and spout off whatever, whatever they want to spout off and not be held accountable for saying something completely opposite not too long ago. Josh Thomas asked, why journalism? Of all the jobs in the world, what made you think, I want to be a reporter? Um, <laughs> well, uh, when I started out, I didn't want to be a journalist. I wanted to be a writer. Um, I, I had this vision of myself writing the great American novel, and I thought, what better way to A, learn how to write, and B, learn about the world 
than to become a journalist and, you know, maybe work for a newspaper for five years, and then I'll have all the material I need to write the great American novel. Well, it's been a little more than five years. Um, uh, and frankly, uh, nonfiction has turned out to be a better, uh, a better uh, topic for me to write about and more, more fun, too. Um, but yeah, journalism will teach you how to be a writer. And uh, the great thing is if you cover enough different things, you'll learn different styles of writing. Diff you'll, you'll exercise different writing muscles, I guess you'd say, uh, so that then when you do decide you're ready to write a book, then you're ready to take that on. Um, uh, I always say that journalism is the greatest job in America in general just because you, you're, you have permission to go ask rude questions of prominent people. Uh, I actually followed Florida's most popular politician into a men's room to ask him a question he did not want to answer. And uh, uh, that's, to me, still one of the high points of my career. So. <laughs> so, you know, especially newspaper folks talk a lot about uh, technology and people ask, I'm sure all the time, where do you see the future of newspapers going? Um, but Samantha asked, how would you say technology has benefited you um, in a way and helps you do your, your job now better than you could have without it? Um, techno I th technology has tremendously benefited me. I, I, heck, I got a book contract out of Twitter. Um, uh, oh, Florida actually started as a series of tweets that I was doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I we used to do a thing at the Times called the Sour Orange Awards. It'd come out every year, and we'd have the list of all the crazy stuff that had happened in Florida that year. Well, the newspaper shrank. Uh, I always tell people that the Times is Florida's best, uh, biggest newspaper, or at least its least shrinking newspaper. Um, and, um, and so we stopped doing that, that annual Sour Orange Awards roundup, but by then Twitter was working and up, and, and so I started tweeting these things, and I would tweet them as, oh, Florida, you know, a uh, woman dressed as turkey arrested for shoplifting. Cops thought there was something funny about her stuffing, you know, something like that. And so uh, uh, an editor at Slate began following me, and so when the uh, George Zimmerman's uh, Trayvon Martin Stand Your Ground trial was coming up in 2013, she contacted me and said, would you like to blog about Florida for a month for Slate? And my editor said it was okay, so I did. I blogged about Florida, basically trying to educate people that, yeah, there, this is going on, but there's a lot more to Florida than just this stand your ground argument that's going on. Uh, and that led to ultimately the book, Oh, Florida. Uh, so I have nothing but good things to say about Twitter because <laughs> I got a book contract out of it. But technology does enable us to do a lot more than we used to do. I mean, used to be when I started out, you, you had, if you were covering a government meeting, you had to go to the government meeting. Now, a lot of times they're live streamed on, on, uh, on the internet. You can watch things from there and simultaneously be checking, you know, the documents that you'd seen and, and uh, what people said previously. Um, you can uh, tweet questions at, at politicians who normally you would have a hard time getting to, and sometimes you get answers back from them. Um, uh, used to be uh, when Jeb Bush was our governor, we could email him questions and he would respond, uh, sometimes at 3 a.m., but he would respond because he was a very avid user of, of email. Uh, when I started out, nobody had cell phones. Uh, you know, now we have those, and so reporters are in reach of their editor just about every time of the day or night. Uh, and some politicians, you can reach them better on their cell phone than you can by going through their staff. So, um, and I've already sung the praises of uh, spreadsheets. So, uh, and the satellite imagery analysis I mentioned, we couldn't have done that when I first started out in journalism, but we were able to do that now, and also, uh, we took a, a lot of the documents we got from the Corps of Engineers were PDF files that were not searchable. And so we were run, able to run them through uh, optical character uh, recognition software and turn them into searchable documents. So once again, another great advance in technology that enabled better reporting. I'm gonna pick this one because um, I covered Matt Gates a while. Uh, how do you think the media should have handled the Matt Gates controversy of being misinformed about what the Immaculate Conception was? <laughs> How do you, how I was do you about to ask you which Matt Gates controversy. Yeah, okay, um, yeah. That, that's uh, not the one that I that I did. But um. well, I was going to say Matt Gates uh, has called for the abolishment of the EPA. He brought a Holocaust denier to the State of the Union address. Um, he's a constant source of news. God, I love Matt Gates. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, um, the the second part of the question there was as a congressman a, from Florida, in case yeah. you guys didn't know. So, so and the son of a former state legislator, Don Gates, who yeah. was, I think, savvier. Let's say much savvier. Yeah. I would <laughs> yeah. say. Um, so, the, Jessica wanted to know, 
uh, how do you deal with things like that and with misinformed subjects that you're interviewing if they're misinformed at the time? <laughs> um, it, it, the, well, obviously you try and when they're talking, you, you, you let them finish the quote for one thing <laughs> and make sure you jot that down accurately. And sometimes you'll ask them, did you mean to say blah, 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 and just make sure you got them on the record saying it, and then you, you might tell them, you know, some, a lot of authoritative sources say this and give them a chance to either back off of it or double down, and more often these days they, they double down than anything else. Uh, but, you know, one of the, uh, how can I explain this? One of the greatest things I ever saw reported. Do you guys know who Dave Barry is? He used to be the humor columnist for the Miami Herald. Actually won a Pulitzer Prize for getting the word booger into print more than anybody else ever did. Um, uh, Dave Barry went to cover a U.S. Senate race in Florida. They sent him out on the road for two weeks. He spent a week with the incumbent, uh, Bob Graham, uh, and then a week with the, I'm sorry, he was the, he was the governor at the time and was running for U.S. Senate. And the incumbent was this woman named Paula Hawkins, who was about this tall and had eyes about this big. Uh, and uh, the meanest thing he did to Paula Hawkins was quote her verbatim. And so her quotes, when they appeared in the story, were about that long. I mean, that was one sentence. And it would, it would, it, he described it, uh, it, they, they, it was like a roller coaster where the sentence would start off going this way and then all of a sudden it would dip down and then it would swoop back and sometimes it would circle around and, and go upside down. And that, was, <laughs> that taught me that that's probably the best way to handle some folks like that is just quote them verbatim and let people read what they're really dealing with. And so that's, that's my advice on dealing with things like that. <laughs> Seth Hawk asks, California is described as a land of fruits and nuts. How would you describe Florida using just two words? <laughs> well, this was my problem with the book. Uh, when I first turned it in, it was 100 pages too long. And the editor said, this is hilarious, but it's too long. You have to cut 100 pages. So out went the skunk ape, Florida's version of Bigfoot. Out went the, the, uh, the guy who claimed he had a love affair with a dolphin. Um, um, so, uh, to describe it in just two words, I, I guess I would say we're the new California. How about that? Fruits and nuts. Fl California had that reputation when I was growing up that California was the, the home of the weird. Uh, but around the time of the 2000 election, everything turned and Florida became suddenly, we were not just a, a pleasant place to visit, uh, you know, on spring break or for, or for vacation, but we were, it, you know, that's, that's when the reaction of Florida was, what, what's going on down there? What is with those people down there? And we've had that reputation ever since. We're the only state that has its own tag on FARC.com. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've got the Florida Man Twitter account and several other Twitter accounts that highlight all the craziness going on in Florida. I see O Florida type stories at least three times a day. So, um, uh, in fact, I saw one this morning before I came over. A, a, a man and woman had been living together for 17 years, and he decided he had had enough and he was going to leave, and her reaction to that was to taser him in the butt. So... <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Because you brought up FARC.com. If you guys don't know what FARC is, it's weird news. You yes. Should look at it. Um, and and they tag them, and then the tags are like you know ridiculous or something like that. But then there's the tag that says Florida, and so all the Florida news gets that Florida tag. Do you think that um, there's a sense of needing to be kind of that entertainment journalist as well as whatever you're covering, making it a little more, um, I guess. As a journalist, you're trained to not sensationalize stories. Right. But now there's this push to, you have to figure out a way to get someone to actually click and read the story. Can you talk a little bit about maybe yeah. some conflict? Yeah, you, you don't want you you to just produce clickbait, but there is a, there is a, um, a temptation to make your story, your serious story, into a more clickbait type story. And you have, to, you have to resist that. But I don't think there's anything wrong with being plain spoken and even entertaining if you can be. I mean, that's, to me, that's the essence of, of my book, O oh, Florida, is it's the, it's, the, it's the spoonful of sugar method of shoveling 50 pounds of Florida history and culture down your throat, is I'm gonna give you funny stuff to laugh about, and then while you're laughing, I'm gonna slip in information about how Martin Luther King led uh, protests in St. Augustine that led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 which a lot of people don't know about. So, you know, yeah, I'm gonna get you to laugh about stuff, but also, you know, like I, uh, I tell in their stories about how Florida has the best road rage stories. And my favorite headline is, man in road rage incident runs over self. Um, 
but then that leads into me talking about how NASCAR was founded in Florida, and it's a, you know now this multi-billion-dollar business that's unlike any other sport in America because it's not run by a group of owners who have a commissioner. It's run by one family, and they own it and they make all the rules. So, you know that I think you can be. Uh, you can approach a story. And you, your whole goal in telling a story to me is to tell it in a way that people want to read it. You, you look for a, a lead that's going to get them into the story and get them wanting to read on. You build transitions. Mrs. Wagner was big on teaching us about making our transitions ironclad and to, to pull people along in the story to, so that they want to read all the way to the end. And uh, I like to try and put a little a good little stinger at the end or a good little kicker at the end sort of as a reward for the careful, careful reader that they've read all the way to the end and here's your reward. Um, so uh, don't just be dry with your telling of stories. Try and tell people stories in a way that they want to read them and not just because it's important but also because you know your greatest, your, your, the big thing you have to be is clear. If your writing is clear then people will want to read it and that's to me, the hardest job of all is just to be clear to people. And um, uh, the temptation is always to slip into using the jargon of the people you're covering, the people you're writing about, especially if you're on the cop beat. Cops have their own lingo, so you'll start talking about the perpetrator and you know all this kind of stuff. Don't do that. Be clear and talk in a conversational way when you write your stories. Ashley Silsby asked, what do you think is the biggest misconception of journalists in television and movies? That it's exciting. <laughs> that every single day is exciting. I always dread the day when uh, we have kids show up who want to tag along and shadow us because half the time I'm sitting at my desk reading government documents looking for information and that's just, it's, it can be very boring. I have lots of great Spotify playlists to listen to to keep me uh, entertained and awake while I'm doing it. But I mean, like right now I'm working on a story where I'm having to read lots and lots and lots of legal documents and depositions in a case, it's a big case, it involves a fight over water and who owns water in Florida. And it does have some interesting, unusual aspects. One of the guys involved is the guy is a rich guy who went to prison for hiring a hitman to kill his own horse for the insurance money. Which is, that's not a story you would see in any other, in any other state. But, um, uh, but the, the, all the legal documents, they're just, they'll make your eyes roll back in your head. They're so dull. But there's a great story in there and once I've got all that together, then I'm gonna, I think I'm going to have some fun trying to tell the story, but I have to do all the, all the dull prep work first. So it's not, it's not nearly as exciting as it looks on, on TV and in the movies. But, you know, um, I guess my favorite, if you guys have seen the movie Spotlight, uh, my favorite part of that is where the one reporter is at home and he's got the documents showing where all these child molesters are and he suddenly realizes he's, he's translating it, the, the raw information over onto a map. So he's mapping these locations and he realizes with horror, looking at the map, there's one right around the corner from his own house. And he actually, you know, actually runs out and runs over to see the, the front door. And that to me is the way you tell a good story is you bring it home to people and you show them this is, this is what's going on in your own neighborhood. And it's not, he took this raw information and found a way that actually brought her home to himself. And so to me, that's what good journalism can do. That kind of translates into Eliza's question. How do you keep your readers engaged consistently? Um, um, it's, a, it's a balancing act. Uh, you know, the, the columns, I try and keep them kind of light and, and fun up until I kind of sucker them into the ending where I, where I hit them in the gut. That's my, that's my goal usually is to, is to provide some little irony or some little twist at the end of the column so that people go, oh, that's what he was talking about. Like I, I did a column where I was praising Publix and how it had this long tradition of service. And then at the end I said, gee, wouldn't it be great if Publix ran our government because Publix is so concerned with serving the customers and our legislators are not that they much prefer dealing with their campaign co contributors than what the voters want. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act you have to do. Zach Lane asks, what were your thoughts on the post and why do you, if you enjoyed it, why do you think it should uh, win Oscar? <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, and in fact, the next movie I'll probably see is Black Panther, not the post. Um, also I, got, a good I got kids, what can I tell you? Um, uh, but, and I honestly, I, and I've told this to my wife, and my wife's poo-pooing me, but I have a hard time seeing um, uh, Tom Hanks, who I will always think of as that guy from Bosom Buddies, 
Um, or as Woody from Toy Story, playing, you know, tough guy, tough editor, Ben Bradley. Uh, if you guys have seen All the President's Men, Jason Robards won an Oscar playing Ben Bradley, and people who knew Ben Bradley said he played the real Ben Bradley. So it's hard for me to picture Woody from Toy Story doing that, but I, you know. <laughs> but I, I hear, I hear um, is it Meryl Streep? I hear Meryl Streep is good, but when is Meryl Streep not good, so. What's the best advice? But, oh, by the way, I'm sorry. If I ran a journalism school, every Friday would be movie day. And it, because every Friday you would see a journalism movie, sometimes two, and then you'd talk about them, talk them out. Uh, and you know, so you'd contrast like the front page with uh, uh, shattered glass, for instance. I think that would be a great way to do things. But nobody's ever going to put me in charge of a J school, so you know. <laughs> uh, some of our students have asked ask the same question or similar questions, what advice would you give them right now? What can they start doing right now to hone their skills and be that kind of journalist that digs more? Um, if you're not on the student newspaper, you need to apply to be on the student newspaper or apply for an internship to work for a newspaper um, and do whatever you can to get in the door. Uh, I got started on the student newspaper not as a reporter but as the circulation manager and I actually got that job because I had a van. That was my sole qualification. <laughs> I had a van so I could carry the newspapers around campus. But that got me in, and once I was in, they couldn't kick me out, even though they probably would have liked to. Um, uh, so just get in there and, and start doing it. And if you, even if you can't get into an established paper, start working on freelance stuff. A lot of magazines will, will buy freelance stuff. A lot of websites want freelance writing. Um, uh, try to make sure you get paid for it because your work is worth something. Uh, but you know, a lot of them are looking for somebody to file stuff. And like I said, there are great stories all around you. People have, everybody has a great story to tell. Everybody has at least one great story to tell. So look around you, think about stories you want to read and then start working on them. Antonio Reese asked, whatever happened to the yacht, the university yacht? Uh, I believe the legislature decided that was a waste of money, which was kind of funny since they were the ones getting most of the use out of it. And um, I'm not sure what happened after that, if it got sold off. Do you know, Mrs. Wagner? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't recall. It sold? Yeah, that would make sense. Although we actually did a story where we quoted different teachers saying, gee, this would be great for us to use for our students. But I guess they didn't do that either. No. <laughs> uh, Aaron Dixon asked, how often do you write a new article for the Tampa Bay Times and maybe... Um, Not often enough, according to my editors. <laughs> uh, but I mean, a lot, of these, a lot of this stuff takes time. It takes time to report it out. Sometimes it takes time to get people to talk to you. Um, um, the billionaire with the dead horse, I'm supposedly going to get to talk to him next week, but we'll see. Then it's taken me about three weeks to get that lined up. So we'll see what happens. But everything takes longer than you think it will take. Um, on the wetlands thing, we promised the editors we'd have it to them in six weeks, and it took two years. So there you go. I'm scrolling through Twitter, but I know that you guys are not a, a shy group of students. Don't and be afraid. Don't be. Don't ever be afraid to ask questions. Don't, uh, Tom Wolf once said that the worst thing about being a journalism is con a journalist is constantly having to be in the attitude of "duh, I don't know anything." But that's necessary. You have to do that, and that's the way you find. You know, if you don't ask questions, you don't find stuff out. Yes, sir. That's actually a good thing. I was going to ask. Um, when you encounter a subject that you're not familiar with, how do you kind of coordinate with other people in the newsroom to sort of? Um, know how to cover that particular topic? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Because the, the thing about journalism is a lot of times, if, if it's not on your beat, then a lot of times you're covering stuff you've never covered before and you don't know what you're doing. So, or even if you're on your beat and you're doing something you've never done before, then you might need to go find experts. Uh, for me, covering the environment, I have a lot of scientists on my, it's not a Rolodex anymore, but on my phone list. Um, uh, that I can call on different topics and, and get educated. Uh, I've got a Python expert, I've got an alligator expert. Um, uh, you know, and, and if you're tackling some job that you've never done before, you'd be amazed at how many people at the newspaper or whatever agency, whatever thing you work for, already know about this stuff. Um, we have a tendency as journalists to look at what's going on right now and think it's always been like that. And so we'll see somebody in front of us who now covers health and not remember, oh, 10 years ago, this person covered courts, and so they may know how the court system works and may have a background on this. Uh, so for instance, on the wetlands story, when I decided I was gonna go after this wetlands story, 
and I knew that there were GIS locations on the permits, I asked my editors, do we have anybody on staff who's good at GIS? And they said, yeah, it's this guy in the Pasco County Bureau, Matt Waite. And I contacted Matt, and we wound up working together on this for two years. And um, uh, Matt is, by the way, is now a journalism professor at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and he's an expert on drones. He's, he, he's decided that's the next big frontier of journalism is learning how to use drones to get information. And so they actually have a drone journalism lab. So if you're interested in drones, that's who to contact. But that's sort of what you have to do. And, and the bottom line is just ask questions. Ask around. Ask people who knows about this. And you'd be amazed. Some, some of the folks that have been at that particular news agency for a long time, they may have a memory. They may know where to look for things that you don't know to look for. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Never be afraid to ask. Thank you. You're welcome. Sable and Paige have another set of questions. Okay. Can I get a, can I get another water bottle, by the way? <laughs> Is there a line, and how do you know when not to cross that line? A line for what? Too far. Something's too far. Something's too personal or too... The subject's too touchy. It might offend people. Is there a line? Um, I think the only way you, you can find that out is to ask the question sometimes and, and, and preface it by saying, I'm sorry if this offends you or I'm sorry to bring this up or I'm sorry if this is a sensitive subject, but I have to ask. And then you ask the question. And uh, uh, the great thing about journalism is you can always blame your editor too. You can say, I'm really, this is the thing I have to do the most often. Our newspaper says that if you're writing about somebody, you know, like a man on the street kind of thing, you have to put their ages in. It's a part of identifying them. And so I always say, I'm really sorry to have to ask you this, ma'am, but my editor makes me, how old are you? And <laughs> even today, there are still a few women who get really upset when you ask them how old they are. But, but I blame my editor, and they're like, oh, okay, all right. And then I give it to you. But, uh, and then sometimes some of the evasions are funny, too. Um, you know, old enough to know better and things like that. So, but that, that's what you have to do, though. You, you Don't be afraid to ask the question, but ask it in a respectful way, I guess is the key. Is And remember the person you're dealing with, especially if they're <clears throat> going through some trauma, that you're not there to add to their trauma. And you can tell them that. You can say, look, I'm, I'm not here to add to your trauma. I'm not here to cause you problems, but I think your story might help others who are in your situation. And so I'm hopeful you can talk to me about that. You'd be amazed how many people are willing to talk. Um, one of the things I learned when I covered my first hurricane is, <clears throat> Uh, you know, you think, oh, these people have been traumatized, they've lost everything, their home has been shattered. Those folks were dying to tell somebody about it. It was the most exciting thing that ever happened in their entire lives. <laughs> so I actually wound up with more information than I needed to tell the hurricane story because people, you know, people saw me talking to someone and they gather around, oh, well, let me tell you what happened to me. So sometimes it's cathartic to people to tell you their story. And so bear that in mind as well. What obstacles do you see forming against journalists today, and what advice can you offer to students to prepare for those? Um, <clears throat> secrecy is probably the biggest thing we run into. The government agencies uh, that are supposed to be open uh, decide that for security reasons or some other made-up reason that they can't tell you what they're doing or they can't give you the documents to tell you what, you're, what they're doing. For instance, um, uh, this group has sued repeatedly to get access to the White House visitor logs, which previously were very freely given by administrations from both parties. But this particular administration doesn't want people to know who's coming in to visit people in the White House. Well, uh, so that's, that's an example of if they're not telling you who's coming in, there must be something wrong with it. So that makes you even more interested in finding out who it is. Um, uh, I mentioned about the EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt. Initially, they didn't want to tell anyone about his travel because they said, oh, there are security concerns. And then it turned out it wasn't security concerns, it's just he prefers traveling first class. So a lot of times those security concerns that get cited are just made up reasons and that there's a real reason behind it. So keep pushing and try and find a, a way to work around it. Um, uh, there, one of my colleagues, Lucy Morgan, used to say, there's always a guy who knows. There's always somebody who knows. So just keep looking and keep poking around and you, you will probably find the guy who has all the documents or Nancy who had all the paperwork in her desk. Josh? Yes, sir. Um, hey. So, as an investigative journalist, is there a story that you feel 
you know, is the best thing you've ever done? And is there also a story that you feel is just like the worst thing you've ever written? Ooh, um, the worst thing I've ever written was a story I wrote for the TROP um, where there was a flu epidemic on campus. And my lead on the story was swooping down on the campus like a hungry vulture. Flu, <laughs> flu has, and I forget the rest of it because it's, it's just so horrible. It was a horribly written story. But, that, you know, it's part of learning. You, right. you write bad stuff and then you learn from it, uh, thanks to all the friends who make fun of you for it for about two weeks. Thanks, Tom. Um, so um, um, I'm really proud of uh, several of the stories I've done. Uh, one of them was about Florida Springs. Uh, Florida has more first magnitude springs than any other place in the world. Uh, first magnitude referring to how much water gushes out from underground. Uh, a Florida Spring is sort of your look into the aquifer that provides our drinking water. And Florida Springs are in trouble. Uh, they're suffering from a loss of flow, mostly due to people pumping so much water out of the ground to water their lawns. And they're polluted. They're suffering from nutrient pollution from uh, fertilizer runoff and septic tanks that are, that are broken and are leaking. And so I did this big package of stories looking at what was wrong with Florida Springs and how uh, under Jeb Bush, they had actually started a, an effort to save the springs. And then when Governor Scott came in, uh, he, cut, he was all about cutting government spending. So he cut the springs efforts, springs restoration efforts. And after I did those stories, suddenly the governor found money for springs again. So uh, I was pretty proud of that. And one of the things that I found out was that the computer model that they were using to issue water permits was bogus. It was based on a faulty premise. Uh, Florida's underground geography is like Swiss cheese. It's limestone, it's full of holes, it's constantly crumbling, that's why we get sinkholes. We get more sinkholes in Florida than anywhere else in America, by the way. Um, and the computer model was based on the assumption that what was underground was actually hard-packed gravel and sand like everywhere else. And so obviously that makes a difference in how fast pollution can travel from one point to another. And so I did, I did that story as well, and that caused this huge scramble. And anyway, so I was pretty proud of that. Lauren Harkson asked, how often do you confer with lawyers on possible news stories? Um, not as often as some of my colleagues. I have a, a, the guy who sit across from, his name's Mark Puente. That guy's a bulldog. He's a total bulldog. And he's been doing a series of stories about uh, this job placement agency that's sponsored by the state and it looks like from his reporting they've been producing bogus jobs numbers for years and getting incentive money in response and he's just totally basically blown up the whole place he's discovered that the director was apparently having an affair with one of the contractors and it's just it's a great story but all of mark's stuff has to go through our lawyer and and uh, as we say get lawyered before it goes into print because there's the chance you know you don't want to you don't want to libel somebody so but that's a that's a necessary part of it. Um, I think the last one that I got lawyered was the big wetlands series that led to Paving Paradise. Now the books get lawyered too. Uh, oh, Florida! I spent about three hours on the phone with the uh, lawyer for the uh, publisher because she wanted to make sure that all the people I had mentioned being arrested for doing things like throwing an alligator through a drive-through at Wendy's, uh, that I had mentioned whether they got convicted or not. So we had to go back and forth on that. And at the end, she said, this is the most work I've ever had to do on one book. And I said, well, I'm, I'm really sorry to put you through this. She said, no, no, it was great. I laughed. This is great. <laughs> so. A couple of our students have asked this. Uh, this one is from Jenna. How do you deal with officials refusing to give you public records, even when you know it's your right to have them? Um, well, if you can go over or around them, you do. Uh, sometimes it turns out that they're available from other agencies. For instance, if they have been emailing with people in other agencies or something like that, you can get them that way. Um, Lucy Morgan, uh, who is our, one of our Pulitzer winning reporters, her other big saying is if you, if you have to sue them, then you may have already lost. So the idea is do everything you can before you go to court to sue them for these public records. Try and get them every, any other way you can before you take that step. Because once you sue them, then you know it's going to take a while because the courts are so clogged and it's hard, to, it's hard to get anything moving in there. So try and be ingenious. You know, ask around. You'd be amazed at all the, all the paper that floats around in government. And pe sometimes people have stuff that they don't even know they have. Um, but it can be frustrating. I've been trying to track down a particular government report on sinkholes for about a year, and I still haven't found it, but I'm pretty sure it's out there. Zach Henson asked, how would you suggest that student journalists work toward finding their niche in journalism? 
Um, think about the kind of stories you like to read, uh, and that's usually a good indication. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm including myself in that because I, I didn't realize it when I got into journalism, but I was already kind of interested in environmental stuff then. Um, I, 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 my family, everybody in my family reads thrillers. We all read these paperback thrillers. My, uh, my grandfather was really into Perry Mason, my mother into the whole Agatha Christie, Hercule Poirot stuff. And I was reading, you know, Raymond Chandler and all those guys. And my great aunt, when I was 14, cornered me and said, I th she took a drag on her palm all and said, I think you're ready for Travis McGee now. And she gave me a book by John D. McDonald uh, that had a half naked woman on the cover. And I, you know, I'm 14. I'm like, yes, ma'am. I'm definitely ready for that. Um, uh, and so, but reading John D. McDonald, John D. McDonald was a guy who lived in Florida starting in 1950. And he wrote this series of books about a guy named Travis McGee. And also wrote lots of other thrillers too. And a lot of them had a sort of a subtle environmental theme to them. And it, it shocked me that these books are set in Florida that this sunny place could have so many shady people in it. It had never occurred to me that mysteries could occur in Florida. And it also had never occurred to me that uh, a lot of the places I like to go as a Boy Scout, uh, you know, canoeing and camping and going hunting with my dad, fun hunting and fishing with my dad, that these places were being threatened by unscrupulous developers. And so that sort of opened my eyes and made me start thinking along those lines. And so when I went into journalism, it took me a while to get to the environmental beat, but once I got to the times and they actually had such a beat, then I went after it and I, I love it. It's a, it's a beat that exists at the sort of uneasy intersection between uh, science, politics, and the law. And it's great because um, in science, scientists embrace ambiguity. They love ambiguous results because it gives them something else to study. Uh, the law wants everything in black and white because that's how you make the rules is you have black and white that says you can do this or that. And then politicians, I have learned over the years, politicians love anecdotes. They want a good story, regardless of whether it's true or not, and then they will base legislation on that anecdote. And so, you know, the whole ambiguity versus black and white versus what makes a good anecdote, you'd be amazed at the conflicts that result from that. And it's, it's, it's a very fruitful field for, for reporting. We got time for this last one. Okay. Um, have you ever followed a lead that you felt was probably true and not had enough evidence to pursue it? Oh, yes, lots of times, lots of times. And, and that's part of the process, you know, and the, you have to go to your editor and say, well, I'm sorry, I, you know, I can't get, I can't get the, the evidence on it. I've, I have heard, for instance, uh, there was a tip I got in, in, on the environmental beat about people working with hazardous waste, and the person who told it to me, I think, was telling the truth but that person didn't have the evidence for it. And all my efforts to get evidence ran into, you know, I ran into a blank wall. So is it true? Maybe, but can I prove it? No, and if I can't prove it, I'm not gonna put it in print. Because the, re the readers deserve to have stories that we know are true, not stories we think are true. That's, you know, that's the essence of what we're selling to them is we're trying to show them this is how things work, not this is what we think is going on. I'll leave that for the editorial page and the columnists to come up with. Thank you.